Hello everyone, welcome back for more biotechnology. So let's talk a little bit more about how cells organize themselves and the sorts of processes that they undertake. And that is definitely going to help us later on in the semester when we start talking about biotech lab techniques. So something that I really drove home in the last video is that we need to have this fundamental understanding about what's a cell made of and what does a cell do, what does a cell produce if we're going to manipulate a cell for biotech purposes, right? So first things first, every cell is going to have what is called a plasma membrane. This is a membrane that is made up of a special type of molecule called a phospholipid that we will talk about later on. And this essentially separates what is inside the cell from what is outside the cell. So extracellular fluid from intracellular fluid. Notably, the intracellular fluid is going to contain all of those organelles that we talked about. So the membrane is essentially a selective barrier that will regulate the entry and exit of molecules. So it's not really like a concrete wall or anything. It's not something that can never be passed. It's not an impenetrable barrier. It is a selective barrier in that certain types of molecules can pass straight through, but most of them won't. So a cell is going to have to activate some sort of uh, internal process to allow a certain type of molecule to pass through if it couldn't uh, otherwise. So some cells are unique in what they produce. We've already looked at one specific example of this, right? So uh, cells in the pancreas called beta cells are the ones that make insulin. So this is kind of interesting. Th those are the only cells in the whole body that make insulin. The gene for insulin, those DNA instructions that tell cells how to make insulin, that's present in every single cell. Every cell in your body has the instructions on how to make insulin, but somehow it's these it's it's only these cells in the pancreas that actually do make insulin. So those are the sorts of things that we'll also want to be aware of as well. Certain cells do things that other cells in the body just don't do. But even so, those pancreatic beta cells also have to do the sorts of kind of day-to-day -day housekeeping functions that all other cells do as well. They have to uh, manage their DNA, they have to make proteins, they have to uh, generate energy through cellular respiration. So uh, there are certain very specific functions that only certain cells do, but then there's more general functions that basically all cells do. Here's another interesting one, something that we may get to see this semester. Not every cell has exactly one nucleus. You would certainly get that impression just from looking at cell diagrams like what we're about to look at in the next few slides. But it's not true. Not every cell has exactly one nucleus. There are two very specific exceptions to this. Skeletal muscle fibers actually have many nuclei. One muscle fiber is one cell, and these tend to be what we call multinucleated. They actually have quite a few nuclei per cell, which is interesting. And then the other interesting one is that red blood cells actually have no nuclei at all. All red blood cells really need to focus on is carrying oxygen, so why the heck would you want to have a whole bunch of the internal uh, volume of the cell taken up with a nucleus? No, you just want to load up on hemoglobin and then boom, let's go, let's carry some oxygen, right? So these aren't necessarily specific things that we've got to understand, but it's these sorts of exceptions to general rules that will allow us to pick the best cell for the job when we're trying to come up with a specific biotech application. These are the sorts of things that you need to be able to kind of research and figure out if you're going to say, this cell is good for my job that I want to do and this cell is not. Okay, so the two major types of eukaryotic cells that we're going to look at here very briefly are plant cells and animal cells. So we'll start with plant cells just because the applications here are not quite as uh, broad. So we'll go ahead and get plant cells out of the way. So you can see inside the plant cell, you can see a nucleus, you can see an endoplasmic reticulum, you can see mitochondria. There are, so most of what you're seeing here is very similar to what you would see in an animal cell and other types of eukaryotic cells as well. But there are a couple of differences that we can note here. Plant cells tend to have a rigid cell wall that is made up of the polysaccharide cellulose. We'll talk about polysaccharides in the next video. So this rigid cell wall basically layers on top of the plasma membrane. It's on the other side of the uh, cell wall. And this allows the plant cell to resist uh, 
intense osmotic pressure. So uh, if you say overwater a plant, uh, all that extra water gets taken up in the plant cell. Normally that would cause a cell to burst, but because of this cell wall, the plant cell is much more resistant to that. The plant cell also contains a different type of organelle that allows for photosynthesis to take place, and these are called chloroplasts. We mentioned those in the last video. Like mitochondria, they have their own DNA. Uh, only photosynthetic organisms are going to have chloroplasts. If uh, you ask yourself, can I perform photosynthesis, and the answer is no, you don't have chloroplasts, so it's not something you need to worry about yourself. And then you also tend to have this central vacuole for water and nutrient storage, kind of getting after that overwatering issue. Any excess water you can kind of store up for later. Okay, so here's an animal cell. So very similar, just no cell wall and no vacuole and no chloroplasts. So animal cells really represent what you're most likely to see most of the time if you're working with eukaryotic cells. So animal cells lack cell walls, but they obviously do still have their plasma membrane. And to give it some structural support, we have what is called the actin cytoskeleton. So if, if you can't really picture what a actin cytoskeleton would look like, here is the imagery I always like to invoke. Imagine a tent. So you have a big tent, like maybe one that you go buy fireworks in on the 4th of July or one at the circus. Uh, a tent is made up of canvas in the same way a cell is made up of plasma membrane. Well, the tent isn't just going to kind of uh, be supported by itself. You've got to have this kind of steel meshwork that you throw the tent over, and that is what the cytoskeleton is essentially doing. It's keeping the plasma membrane kind of fully inflated so it doesn't really collapse in on itself. So I do want to provide a, word, uh, a few word of, words of caution about cell diagrams like this. They are nice to look at. They are very artistically done and they're uh, pretty. But diagrams like this one are not necessarily drawn to scale. So if you look at this diagram, you see, okay, there's one mitochondria, two mitochondria, three mitochondria. So you might come to the conclusion that cells have three mitochondria, and that's just not true. So as far as mitochondria go, cells tend to have hundreds or even thousands of mitochondria. Uh, lysosomes, same story. So you don't necessarily want to take to the bank everything that you're seeing in a diagram like this. It's just kind of to give you an idea of what these organelles look like, where they tend to be positioned, and what they tend to do. So certain things you can take to the bank, certain things you shouldn't. Yeah, so the nucleus is one exception. Uh, most cells do just have that one nucleus. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about that plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is what keeps what's inside the cell inside and what keeps what's outside the cell outside. For a lot of biotech applications, the plasma membrane can be a little bit of a nuisance. If the cell has made something that we want to harvest, we need to find a way to get through that plasma membrane to get what we want. So it is definitely worth our time to learn about the plasma membrane itself. So the plasma membrane is a bilayer of phospholipids. So the, these are these little red dots with the little yellow tails on them. When we say a bilayer, we mean we have one layer on top facing towards the outside of the cell, and we have another layer on the bottom facing towards the inside of the cell. So the other thing that you'll notice here is that we have a number of different proteins that are suspended within the bilayer, kind of like icebergs floating in the ocean. So you can see in blue here a lot of these different proteins. So that's something that we can maybe talk about later in the semester, but these membrane proteins that are embedded in the membrane uh, can help to impart special functions to the cells that have them. So what makes one cell different from another cell very well may be what type of membrane proteins they have. So let's look at a specific example of this. So this is getting into a little bit of human physiology. But since we've already talked a lot about insulin and the need for producing synthetic insulin, this is as good an example as any for us to look at. So... Uh, the plasma membrane itself, we said that it is selectively permeable. Well, one of the molecules that cannot make it through the membrane all by itself is glucose. Glucose is a polar molecule. The membrane generally does not let polar molecules through without any sort of assistance or go-around. Go 
So the plasma membrane will not allow polar molecules like glucose or electrically charged particles like sodium and potassium to pass through directly. So if we go back to uh, the phospholipid bilayer here, if you're picturing a molecule passing straight through, you would picture it kind of squeezing in between these phospholipids and then making it out through the other side. So things like glucose and sodium and potassium can't do that, right? So the problem here is that when you eat food, when you eat your meal and you digest your food and then you absorb that glucose into your bloodstream, that glucose is all out here in the bloodstream in, the extra, in one of the extracellular fluids. Well, that glucose doesn't do us any good out there. We need to get that glucose delivered to the inside of the cell to where the mitochondria are because the mitochondria take glucose and oxygen and do cellular respiration to make lots of energy for our cells to use. So that glucose doesn't do us any good out there. We need to get it inside the cell. But that's our conundrum, right? Glucose can't make it through the membrane all by itself. It is going to need some help. So that is where insulin comes in. So in a case in which you do not have any insulin in the blood, which would be the case if you are either diabetic or if you are in what you would call a fasted state, meaning it's been a while since you've eaten, there are these proteins that function in allowing glucose to make it through the membrane, basically kind of think of it like a tunnel that goes through the membrane that glucose can travel through. These proteins are called GLUT4, G-L-U-T-4. So these proteins, if they are in the plasma membrane, they can allow glucose to pass through and get inside the cell. But without insulin, these proteins are stuck inside the cell embedded in this vesicle that you see right here. So as long as things are like how you see here, the GLUT4 channels are not in the membrane, glucose is going to be stuck out here. So that's where insulin comes in. When insulin, the hormone insulin binds to its insulin receptor, this is going to cause some things to happen inside the cell that will lead to these GLUT4 channels being inserted into the plasma membrane, and now suddenly glucose has a pathway to get inside the cell. So that is going to be how we reduce the amount of glucose in the blood, which of course is the whole purpose of insulin for diabetics. You want to reduce their blood glucose, so this is how that insulin mechanism works. And this is a very good example of how important membrane proteins are. And there are plenty of other examples of ways in which cells pick and choose when to allow certain molecules in and out of the cell. So there will be times in which glucose can get into the cell if insulin is present, and there will be times in which it cannot when insulin is not present. And there, like I said, there are other examples of things that work just like that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the nucleus. So we mentioned that most cells have exactly one nucleus, and this is going to be where we store our chromosomes. Most eukaryotic cells are what you would call diploid, meaning that the nucleus will contain two copies of each chromosome. So for humans, we have 23 different chromosomes. Uh, so if we are diploid, if we have diploid cells, that means uh, each cell will contain 46 chromosomes, two copies of each of the 23 chromosomes, one copy from dad and one copy from mom. The nucleus itself is surrounded by its own membrane called the nuclear envelope, and inside the nucleus, this is going to be the site of DNA replication and gene transcription. Gene transcription being the first step in taking those DNA instructions and turning them into a protein. So this is going to lead us into a discussion on what is called the central dogma of molecular biology. So we mentioned something in chapter one about it's really nice in biotechnology that DNA is kind of a universal language that all organisms speak. And a big reason for that is that all organisms follow this central dogma. So what this central dogma essentially describes is the relationship between the genes in the DNA and how proteins and other molecules in the cells are made. Every cell is going to do it almost exactly like how we see it here. So on the far left here, you have an entire chromosome, one very large molecule of DNA, 
one very small part of that chromosome is going to be an individual gene, the instructions for making one protein. The transcription process involves us making a copy of that gene, that copy being a molecule called a messenger RNA. That messenger RNA will then be read by a large protein slash RNA molecule called a ribosome, and that ribosome essentially is going to be the uh, construction crew that reads the instructions in the mRNA, reads the instructions, and makes the protein according to the instructions. So during transcription, a single gene is read and copied into a messenger RNA molecule, that mRNA is exported out of the nucleus to where the ribosomes are, and those ribosomes will read the messenger RNA and synthesize a protein. And from there, the protein can fold, be sent to wherever it's going to be sent, and then it can do what it's supposed to do inside the cell. So for example, insulin might be like this. Insulin might need to be secreted into the blood. Uh, the insulin receptor might need to be inserted into the membrane and so on and so forth. Okay, so the central dogma can be a little bit difficult to completely understand right away, and that's totally fine. That's totally understandable. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to rediscuss the central dogma with my cookbook analogy that I introduced in chapter one. So uh, I said that a whole chromosome is kind of like a cookbook, but generally speaking, you only want one recipe at a time, right? You're not going to make the whole cookbook for a dinner, right? You'd have to be very hungry in order to want to do something like that. So let's take that same analogy and put an extra restriction on that. Let's say that you can't take this cookbook with you. Let's say that the only place you can find it in the library uh, you can the only place you can find the cookbook is in the library and you can't remove the cookbook from the library so how are you going to make this recipe at home well you might want to say take the cookbook and then you're if you can't take the cookbook with you you want to make a copy of the recipe that you're going to use right so you could maybe use a copier uh, inside the library to scan and make a copy of the recipe that you want to try out. So you're not taking the whole cookbook with you to your kitchen, you're just taking the recipe that you're using. Okay, so you take this recipe to your kitchen and you cook up the meal, right? So that would be how you would do it based on these restrictions that we're placing on ourselves. The cookbook is only in the library and you can't take the cookbook with you. So these restrictions probably seem a little bit silly, but there's a reason why I put these restrictions here, because those are the restrictions that are basically placed on the chromosomes. So chromosomes are extremely large pieces of DNA. So very large, very cumbersome, very hard to work with. Chromosomes cannot be transported freely throughout the cell. They've got to stay inside the nucleus. Even if we wanted to take them out of the nucleus, we would not be able to do so. They're just way too big, right? So way too big to be taken out of the nucleus. So the way that we are going to make a protein is we're going to do the same thing we did in the library. We're going to make a copy of one particular gene that we found on that chromosome. So we pick out our gene and we make a copy of it. And that is the transcription process. We make a molecule of messenger RNA. That is the copy of the recipe that we choose to cook. We're not taking the whole cookbook or DNA molecule with us. We're picking the one recipe that we want and we're making a copy of it to take with us. So this messenger RNA molecule does not stay inside the nucleus or the library. We're going to take it with us to where we can actually make our protein, where we can make our meal. So the messenger RNA is exported out of the nucleus, out of the library, into the place where you find the ribosomes, which is the cytoplasm or the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So we're not going to cook our meal in the library, we're going to cook it in the kitchen. So we need to take our copy of the recipe, take it from the library to the kitchen. In the case of the central dogma, we're taking our copy, our messenger RNA, away from the nucleus and we're getting it to the construction site for the protein, and that is the ribosome. So hopefully you found that analogy helpful. Uh, it certainly made sense to me, but definitely uh, the central dogma is not something you should expect to just totally get right away. It's going to take a little bit of practice, so you might kind of think of analogies of your own. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about that messenger RNA molecule. 
So we've already mentioned several times, a gene represents instructions on how to make a protein, right? So messenger RNA, it's just a copy of that same gene, right? So that messenger RNA transcript is a copy of that gene that we can take with us, right? We can take it to the ribosome. So that messenger RNA still contains those exact same instructions on how to make that protein in the form of what are called codons. So codons are something that we'll talk about later, so don't worry about it too much right now. So the ribosome is going to bind to the messenger RNA once we get those two things in the same place, and the ribosome will begin reading the transcript like you would read a recipe and read your instructions, and the ribosome will know, based on the codons that it is reading, it will know which amino acids to put in which order. So a particular codon will tell us to use this amino acid here. The next codon will tell us this amino acid goes next. So essentially, the order of those codons in the messenger RNA will tell the ribosome how to put the protein together. And this is all determined by what is called the genetic code. And this genetic code is nearly universal. Almost every organism uses this genetic code here. So a codon is a stretch of three bases that you find in the DNA or the RNA. So each stretch of three bases will have a particular amino acid that it corresponds to. So for example, if... Uh, the messenger RNA starts with AUG, the ribosome will read that AUG and know that the amino acid methionine is corresponding there. So it will start with methionine, and then if the next codon says AAU, then the ribosome will know to include the next amino acid being asparagine. So this genetic code, which again, is something that we'll cover a lot later, so don't worry about it too much for right now, this genetic code is basically our Rosetta Stone, for lack of a better uh, comparison, it is our Rosetta Stone that allows us to translate a DNA RNA language into a protein language. It is the language that the ribosome has to speak in order to make a protein. Okay, so a lot more on that later. So just kind of a nice introduction to the central dogma. So. Let's talk a little bit about mitochondria and chloroplasts. I mentioned before that they contain their own DNA, which is extremely interesting. So because of that, the nucleus is not the only place that you will find DNA in a eukaryotic cell. So mitochondria and chloroplasts each contain their own DNA, which is maintained as a circular plasmid, which is very similar to how bacteria do it, right? The reason this is interesting is because of what is called endosymbiotic theory. It is thought, and there is considerable evidence for this, that mitochondria and chloroplasts both previously, thousands and thousands, maybe millions of years ago, existed as their own independently functioning organisms. At some point, hard to say exactly when, but at some point, uh, the precursor for what are our cells today absorbed and engulfed a mitochondrion and basically formed a symbiotic relationship with it. Basically, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. You make energy for me, I'll give you all the materials that you need to do that. And it's the same thing with chloroplasts. What eventually would become plant and algae cells must have absorbed a, bact a photosynthetic bacterium that is considerably very much like a chloroplast. So, the cost of this is that over the course of evolution, uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts have kind of gotten a little bit entitled and lazy. They're starting to depend a lot more on the DNA and the nucleus rather than their own DNA. So a lot of information from their genomes has been lost over the years. So currently for the human mitochondrial genome, it actually only contains 13 genes as, it oppo as opposed to about 25,000 genes in all of our chromosomes in the nucleus. So it's not like the mitochondria has this huge set of chromosomes. It, it can only really make 13 genes. And then just a fun little fact, not really that important for us, but just a fun little fact. 
It turns out all of the mitochondrial DNA in your cells was inherited from your mother. Every single bit of it, all from your mother. So make sure you call your mother tonight and thank her for her generous donation of her mitochondrial DNA. Make sure you thank her a lot. She likes that, right? So, uh, what is a little bit more germane for our discussions in the future is what the mitochondria and the chloroplasts do, right? So mitochondria are the sites of cellular respiration and chloroplasts are the sites of photosynthesis. So you can actually see some mitochondria here in this electron micrograph that we're looking at here. Or actually, no, these are, excuse me, these are not mitochondria, these are actually chloroplasts. You can actually see the stacks of thylakoids here that contain uh, chlorophyll. Speaking of chlorophyll, that is the photosynthetic pigment. Chloroplasts contain chlorophyll, which is a light-absorbing pigment that allows plant and algae cells to absorb solar energy and convert that into the chemical energy of sugars and starches and things like that by starting with carbon dioxide and water. You can start with very low energy molecules like CO2 and water, absorb solar energy, and then through a number of complex processes in photosynthesis that we are not going to talk about, uh, generate high energy molecules like sugars and starches. And then oxygen is produced as a byproduct. And obviously we use that oxygen and we use that sugar and starches in order to facilitate cellular respiration. Speaking of cellular respiration, uh, it is the mitochondria that contain the enzymes that make cellular respiration possible. So essentially the way this relationship between photosynthesis and cellular respiration works is that whatever the products are of photosynthesis, usually some type of sugar and oxygen, those will be the starting materials for cellular respiration. And the end products for cellular respiration, CO2 and water, those will be the starting products for photosynthesis. This cycle can go again and again and again and again as long as the sun is out there providing the energy for those things to occur. So high energy food molecules and oxygen produced during photosynthesis are harnessed by the mitochondria to produce a very high energy molecule called adenosine triphosphate or ATP. So here's the interesting thing, and this is a very common misconception. You might fool yourself into thinking that, okay, plant cells have chloroplasts, animal cells have mitochondria, and it's an either or scenario. That is not true. It is true that animal cells do not have chloroplasts, they just have mitochondria. Plant cells absolutely have both chloroplasts and mitochondria. Plants are what we call autotrophs. They make their own food, they make their own sugar and starches through photosynthesis, and then they eat or consume that through cellular respiration. Since animals do not have chloroplasts and therefore we are unable to perform photosynthesis, we can only perform cellular respiration, we have to do something to replace the photosynthesis. And that is why we have to either eat plants, eat the products of photosynthesis or eat other animals in order to provide the starting materials that we need in order to perform cellular respiration. Okay, so let's talk very briefly about a couple of other different organelles that you're likely to find inside the cell. And this brings up an important point that we made earlier about picking the right cell for the job, right? If you have an idea for something you want to produce in your biotech company, you want to make sure you're picking a cell that is capable of doing that. So for example, liver cells have a very high number of an organelle organelle called a lysosome. Lysosomes are basically little recycling plants or garbage dumps. They degrade molecules and other organelles that have been damaged or have outlived their usefulness. Muscle cells have a lot of ribosomes and mitochondria, so they are good at making proteins and making energy. And that makes sense because muscle contraction is something that is very energy costly and requires a lot of proteins working together. Testicular and ovarian cells have a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And that makes sense because the smooth ER is where steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen are synthesized. 
So there's plenty of other examples too, but it's organelle differences like this that is another important thing to consider if you're thinking about using an animal cell for biotech purposes. If you're wanting to mass produce a steroid hormone, you're probably not going to want to pick a cell that does not have much smooth endoplasmic reticulum, for example. So some common cell lines that are used in biotech settings, we may not see any of these this semester, uh, but something that as you go through your biotech journey, you are sure to see a lot of. Uh, Chinese hamster ovary cells or CHO cells are very commonly used uh, animal eukaryotic cells used for the production of recombinant proteins like TPA or maybe even insulin, although insulin you'd probably just want to use uh, bacterial cells. Uh, HeLa cells are a type of cervical carcinoma cell, so it's a cancer cell line. Uh, they're called HeLa cells. HeLa is an abbreviation for the name of the woman who uh, had this cancer. Her name was Henrietta Lacks. Uh, so uh, HeLa cells are very commonly worked with, but you do need to be a little bit aware that because they are cancer cells, they are going to be a little bit wonky. They have uh, a lot more than 46 chromosomes. They may have hundreds of chromosomes per cell because it is a cancer cell. Most th things tend to be a little bit weird. Uh, and their metabolism is going to be a little bit different uh, than a normal cell would be. Uh, another one that you may see at some point are called HEC 293T cells. Uh, these are human embryonic kidney cell lines, and like CHO cells, they tend to be little protein factories, so they're a good uh, thing to pick if you're looking to uh, make a lot of a particular type of protein. And then, of course, there are non-mammalian cells that are used for a variety of other purposes as well, including uh, uh, baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, a prokaryote like E. coli, and then a variety of others as well. So depending on kind of where you go in the biotech industry, you are likely to see a bunch of different types of cells. So we mentioned this before, but bacteria and prokaryotes are the simplest uh, in terms of their organization and their genetics, and they tend to be the easiest to manipulate. And the best example of this is the bacterium Escherichia coli, or E. coli, which you can see here. So the, the genetics behind how E. coli operates are very, very well understood they're easy to grow, they're easy to manipulate. They tend to be grown either in a broth culture, which we should see at some point this semester, or they can be plated and grown as colonies on these little agarose plates that are infused with antibiotic. The general idea behind the antibiotic is that if you introduce DNA into a bacterium, that DNA probably will contain a gene for antibiotic resistance, and it's for this reason you would want to plate it on an antibiotic plate to ensure that only the bacteria that you have inserted DNA into are going to be the ones that survive and grow. Much more on that later in the semester. So when you're working with living cells in a lab setting, you, you obviously need to be careful, right? So uh, working with cell lines in a lab is referred to as cell culture. The major, major thing you have to be on the lookout for is you want to maintain sterile conditions. You do not want contamination. Contamination can ruin an entire experiment or production process. So if you're talking about uh, eukaryotic mammalian cells, you want to maintain sterile conditions to keep nasty, unwanted bacteria and fungi out because, like I said, that can ruin the whole party. It's happened to me in the past when I worked in a lab. So cells, uh, uh, mammalian cells are grown in plastic ventilated flasks like what you're seeing here. You're seeing this uh, technician or scientist working with this plastic flask right here. The cells are suspended within a liquid medium, this kind of pink liquid that you see here. And that medium contains things like nutrients and growth factors, antibiotics to keep contamination away, although that's not foolproof. So the medium contains basically all the things that the cells need in order to grow and stay alive. And anytime we're working with cells, we generally want to do our work in a laminar uh, flow hood that you're seeing here. This flow hood is going to constantly cycle in fresh and uncontaminated air. So it takes away the possibility that the air inside and around the flask can become stagnant and concentrated with bacteria and fungal spores. So it's constantly circulating in fresh air and reduces the possibility of 
contamination. All right, so uh, apologies for the longer video here, but that is going to do it for this video. Uh, so join us next time and we will start talking about individual macromolecules like carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. This, this next video will be another one a little bit on the long side. So try to bear with me, but I look forward to seeing you then.